Хорошо, друзья, меня зовут Питер Игнатович, uh, The Bible Church PDX, if you follow social media in any platform, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, type that, The Bible Church PDX, you'll be able to find us. Может быть, вы послушаете меня сегодня и скажете, never mind, I'll unsubscribe, and that's over. Um, and my personal Facebook and Instagram is Peter Anna Ignatovich. Um, and here is the Anna. If you need to figure that out. You know. She's the only woman in our house. Maybe um, two years ago, we got the, another female in our house, and it's a cat. Um, <laughs> it's a good cat. Uh, boys gave her a name, Duchess. Uh, so she rules the house. I mean, she is truly a duchess. Eddie, the goofy one right in the middle, got married two weeks ago. So he's out of the house and we're excited. <laughs> so uh, now about you. How many of you were born in the United States? Okay, uh, let me ask that question to the vice versa. Who was not born in the United States? Okay, there are a few old people, yeah, right there. Okay, that's good. Uh, how many, <laughs> how many of you are under 20? Under 20? Uh, seriously? Everybody's over 20? Man, a bunch of old people. All right, that's okay. A um, couple more questions. Um, how many of you came to the United States within the last five years? Anybody? Last five years. Okay. Кто приехал? Кто приехал в Америку в течение последних пяти лет? Нет, все, все больше, чем пять. Okay, that's good. So, would it be okay if I speak English primarily and then Russian here and there? Uh, you're more than welcome to speak either way. So, я приехал в Америку, мне было 17. My parents were in their 40s. Um, I have a younger brother uh, who was five years younger, well, he's still five years younger. Uh, that didn't change. Um, but, and so, right about that, in early 1992, uh, we came. In 93, I was chosen to be a youth leader for the church in Salem. Um, probably many of you heard Salem Church, right? Slavic Christian Church of Salem. That, that's where I grew up. For the last 25 years, I was there faithfully. Um, and I started as a youth leader. And then life changed. I became a church secretary, church admin, the deacon, in charge of other things, you know. The reward for good work is what? More work, yes, that, that, that's how it works. So, um, and that's how you grow, that's how you grow. So leadership will require, God, I mean, let me, let me put this phrase, phrase, write it down. God doesn't have an employment department. You know, this is something that you need to know. As you grow as a leader, your positions will continually change. God will put you in a place where you need it the most. God will not stop working on you as long as you're available. You will start maybe as a youth leader, as a Sunday school teacher, as uh, whatever, kitchen aid, um, you know, just helping people. And then God will lead you in a place where you need it the most. So we will talk about a lot of things. So today I, will, uh, I have only six slides, uh, and I will explain how these six slides will work. Each slide is a loaded slide, a lot of stuff in it. Um, none of it is mine. And uh, this is like research done by very smart people. Uh, but we will talk about a lot of those things. I will talk through the slide quickly. Then I will ask you to participate in the discussion. And then we'll have Q&A at the end of every slide. OK? If you don't get through all six, it's OK. I can show you all the slides. And you'll tell me, uh, skip that one. We don't care. Get me the, the, the one that we like. Uh, so, but I really want to get on this one. So here it is, Christian Schwartz. Christian Schwartz, a German guy, um, he wrote a book, uh, Natural Church Development, a guide to eight essential qualities of healthy churches. So that book was done through a research. They, um, I think they're continuing to uh, survey churches. So what do they do? They look at the church and see they survey a growing church, church that continually growing. And they're trying to figure out why does this church grow and how come the church next door on the same street in the same town doesn't grow. So when they did the research, I think they uh, did more than 3,000 churches um, originally 
in a bunch of countries in the world in different economic uh, and political and other ways um, environments and they figure out that country politics uh, economy has nothing to do with the church growth here are the essential qualities of those churches that are growing so when we talk about youth ministry kids ministry when we talk about next generation we need to think how can we build not the system not um, not the model but how can we put the principles in our ministry that will make our youth grow are you guys excited about growth yes. all right I mean, that's what we want right we want people to come we want people to stay and we want people to grow spiritually and become mature and they will multiply that's how growing ministry happens right you start with the people you have you grow them up they'll mature up and they will become the people that will lead the next generation so first thing is empowering leadership so let me ask you the question if i talk about empowering empowering <laughs> i can say it empowering leadership what does it mean to you? Okay. So you support people, right? So what else? Yeah, any yeah, go ahead. Very well, very well. Uh, very, very I mean what else? Just just so um, you see there, you see potential. I think that's what, what I was looking for. You see that person can become a leader. Uh, number one problem, so question, a survey question. Um, when should you appoint a person to do your job? At what percentage of their um, competency? How competent they should be when you give them your job? 30%. 30%. I was like, you know, if they do like maybe 75%, you know, I don't have to babysit them. They'll be okay. No, they said, you need to replace yourself when you have a person who can do your job at 30% of your capacity. And if you stick around with them for just a little bit longer, they will get to 75% and that's when you leave them. Because you don't want them, you don't want to be them there until they become like you. Because as soon as they become like you, you become their cap. You want them to be better. So you get them to about 70%, and then you walk away and say, hey, uh, now you know the basics. Go ahead. So if their basics are 70%, you know, they have a lot of room to grow, and they'll become better than you. So that's what empowering leadership is. Start at 30%. If you see a person who can teach a class, um, you know, once in a while, okay. Ask them to teach it once in a while. If they can set chairs, you know, they set three chairs, and, but they never finish the whole room. Ask them to say, you know what, I think you're doing really good setting these three chairs. Can you like set chairs for the rest of the room? That's empowering leadership. Like you trust in them, that's great. They, they can do it, they can pull it off. Next one, give oriented ministry. Um, how, how that works, uh, anybody? Uh, what, what if I will call I don't have your names, so I'll call you by the color of your shirt. How about that? Um, good thing you guys are a colorful group. I like that. Um, and so um, I'll start with a green jacket or whatever. <laughs> Sorry, that's so lame, uh, but it is what it is, a green jacket. Uh, it's better than a black trench coat. Um, but um, gift to rented ministry, what does it mean to you? What do you think? So you, what do you look for? Do you look for people with specific gifts to assign, to put them in a position, or you um, develop a gift because you have a ministry? Or um, you have a guy who like, I don't know, uh, you can play piano and you say, oh, I have a piano a gift ministry. Uh, why don't we buy a piano for the church now, you know, since we have the pianist? Um, idea is a bit different. So here's how it works. 
who's doing your um, finances in your youth group or in your church? Is that a bookkeeper? Right? Question, does that bookkeeper have fi financial education? Yes? Okay, how about, how about your choir director? <laughs> I mean, if we're talking about an ideal world, then yeah. So, um, so you don't have an educated choir director, so you know, with a choir, I don't know, diploma, right? I'm a dip, you, know, you know, I can move my hands, you know, and tell people how to scream. Uh, you know, how do you, how do you, you know, but how did we choose that choir director to be the choir director? There got to be, more, but, but here we go. How about, how do we choose youth leaders? We don't have the previous youth leader. <laughs> we have nobody. Who, uh, who going to be our next sacrifice that will throw an altar and <laughs> see if they can? More <laughs> <laughs> uh, how do they call it? We throw bones, right? Or <laughs> Вот только кости остаются потом, you know, we, uh, you know, so a lot of times, you know, what do we look for? You know, when we talk about gifts, you know, um, there are multiple gifts, you know, gifts of teaching. Do we want to have a Sunday school teacher who has a gift of teaching, right? Or we want to have people with compassion in a compassion ministry, you know, and probably you don't want to have a person with a compassion gift as your church admin. Because it's going to be a, you know, it's going to be like a mess. This person will never straighten anybody out. You know, they'll be cleaning garbage after everybody by themselves at 3 o'clock in the morning. You know, you need to have a person who has like leadership gift as your church admin. You know, church administrator. Or, you know, as, yeah, whatever, how are you call them. You know, because you need to have somebody who's mean, like me. You know, it, it, mean people are all good. Because otherwise, it, things are going to go sour really quickly. You know, you kind of figure things out. But in youth ministry, it's different. With kids, you cannot be like, too strict. You've got to be compassionate a little. You've got to be teaching a little. And it's important that you develop your gifts. So how do you do that? Think about your, your ministry. Are you guys surrounded by people that you know their gifts? Or you just know their names and their functions? Think about your team. How did you choose the team around you? Was it chosen based on gifts or based on something else? Friendships, relationships, parents, just like kind of, oh, when we were kids, we were hanging out, hanging out together in Sunday school. I think they're good buddies of ours. Something, growing churches will appoint people in a positions and will surround themselves based on their gifts. I need a person in my prayer ministry. I will find a person who is praying by themselves, develops gifts. God speaks to them. They have a revelation. God uses them in a, in a prophetic word. God, God is, we, we see gifts in them. I'm like, I want to put this guy and I want to position them so that their gift will continue to minister to the church in the most wonderful way. Um, I think uh, Einstein, Einstein said, um, if you will judge fish by its ability to climb trees, it will die thinking she was stupid. I think that's about the quote, as close as I can get it. But, but that's the reality. How many ministries we have ruined because we appointed people who don't have proper gifts for that ministry, and then they suffered, we suffered, uh, we blamed them. Man, we just put their right guy with the wrong gift in, in the wrong place and then what happens so don't ruin people's lives help me out we're talking about leadership if you put a person with the wrong gift in their ministry you ruin them and you're going to make a big mess that you have to fix afterwards okay um, it's always easier not to put person in leadership position than to take them out of that position so don't put people in the leadership position until you know, you figure out what their gift is. Make sense? Okay, let's go. So as soon as I'm done through with all of them, um, we will be able to have questions, Q&A, okay? Practical questions. Passion and spirituality. 
Uh, let's talk about this for a few minutes. How would you define passion spirituality personally? Like, Serge, let, let, let's just pick on you. When uh, you know spirituality or your spiritual state or the state of your team or your youth or your church, it's, it's not something that you're just like, ah, oh, whatever. I got to, you know, power leaders. You know, I got to put pe people that are gifted or, fu or functional structure. But when you're passionate about it, when you understand that the people come here because they want some spiritual food about it, and that's what you're concerned about. That's what you strive for, for every person in your team, every person in your youth to have that spiritual encounter to grow spiritually. So that, that's if the uh, leader wants it, right? So how about church with a spiritual uh, passion and spirituality, or like a youth group. Can we imagine a youth group with a um, passion and spirituality? How would that look like? Enjoy Say again? Enjoy being, enjoy being there. They kind of like the prayer, they like the atmosphere, they like... Okay, go ahead. Uh, they're living every day after your youth service. They're actually living... Uh, that, that's what I was looking for, right there. So th sometimes there is disconnect between wonderful service and then personal life. Passion and spirituality, when people say, I will not do anything that will hinder uh, God's ability to use me every day of the week. Uh, somebody said it really nicely, and it goes like this. I will not sin because I'm afraid of punishment. I will not sin because I'm afraid God will not use me for, to do something great. And I think that's where the power comes. I will not sin because I'm afraid that God will not use me to, do, to use me for something great. That, that is passion and spirituality. I want to be used by God. I want to maintain clean. I mean, George David Duke was awesome. You guys have been to the conference, right? Um, he was talking about it. Um, what we're filled with will shine through. And we cannot allow anything um, stopping that passion and spirituality. We will clean ourselves pure. Functional structures. Functional structures. Um, we don't want to get to the point of a legalistic church, right? So how do you keep order? How do you keep order on one side and then allow people to do, to have freedom so that structure doesn't hinder uh, their uh, growth? You know, sometimes you can say, uh, if you want to talk to me, if you want to create a youth event, if you want to take youth for a, you know, a trip, uh, here is the seven steps you need to go. You need to uh, gather the people, you need to have a sign-up sheet, you need to fill out the papers, you need to talk to me, you know, youth leader, right? And then uh, that paper and the youth leader got to go to the, you know, church board and ask for budget. And then Bratsky Soviet will make a decision if they're going to give you a budget or not. Will they give you a van or not? Will they allow you to go or not? Will they compare, they'll compare that to a church calendar of other events if it's not conflicting to anything. And then they'll say uh, yes. And then you have to prove that when you go there, you're going to be uh, passionate <laughs> spiritually and you're not going to play soccer and girls will going to wear skirts and um, boys will stay away in a different van. Uh, and then you're like, we're not going. Thank you very much. <laughs> Great idea, but we are not going. So what was the point of going then? We just want to hang out with girls. I mean, come on. I mean, isn't that like, why do we need to? So why don't you just say that? You know, we want to hang out with girls. Oh, OK. Yeah. Do a barbecue at you know, pastor's house. I mean, that's easy, right? You know, everybody's welcome. No budget, nothing. I mean, no vans, easy. Uh, so functional structures. Uh, figure out what do people want and then support their, their concepts. It's very, very important. Um, I, I really like um, uh, second, no, it's Acts, Acts chapter two, uh, verse 42. I think it's very structural uh, system how church worked. What did they do? Look, Acts 2, 42. Они пребывали в учении апостолов, молитвах и преломлении хлеба. So what did they do? So if you read first 41 verses, it's all outreach. 
It's like evangelism, evangelism, evangelism. They're talking to their neighbors. They're talking to their neighbors. Somebody, can, can somebody read me chapter 40, 41? Uh, chapter, verse 41. Hey, there went. Those who accepted this message were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to the number that day. Okay, so evangelism outside causes what? Conversions and baptism, right? Very structural, right? What do you do? You preach the gospel, and then you lead people through the process. Bam, they're baptized. Great. 3,000 people added to the church. What do you do with those people? Verse 42. What does it say? I'll read in English one more time. Or right, keep going. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Okay. So they devoted. What does devotion mean? They followed some kind of thing. They were going to church on a regular basis. Right? Discipline? Right? They were disciplined. So there were times when they would gather and they would talk about what? What did the apostles talk? And they were breaking bread, fellowship, eating. We're going to get there, guys, I promise. I'm, I'm looking forward to that, too. Uh, we're going to have some coffee and uh, some, I don't know, something else, cookie maybe. Too. Um, it's exciting. Without that, church cannot function. It's important. Breaking the bread. Uh, think about your youth group, your Sunday school class. How much time do you devote to a fellowship outside of teaching? It's got to be devoted time. It's got to be dedicated time. There got to be outreach outside of the youth group. You know, we got to be doing something on the, on the other side. Then we gather. Then we listen. Then we break the bread. Then we pray together. And if we do that, I'll read the last verse of that chapter. How does that sound? Go ahead. Praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. Can you imagine? And that's how the church was. They were happy. They were rejoicing. They were saying, that's so awesome. God adding people to us. They never said, oh, man, we did this outreach and we brought 100 people to our church. Or we stole like three families from the other church. Or we went and we raided their youth and we grabbed the best people and we brought to our youth group. It's not what they're saying, right? So they're saying, man, we were working in the neighborhoods. We were praying. We were learning. We are sharing bread together. We are praying more, listening to the teachings, and God just grew our church, grew our youth. It was like awesome. I want to be Acts 2 church. Very simple, right? Inspiring worship service. Inspiring worship service. All growing churches based by uh, Christian Schwartz. They had inspiring worship service. So question is, what other worship service can you have? What's the opposite of inspiring? Condemning. Condemning, boring, uh, I don't know. Ordinary. Ordinary. Ordinary, like lame, I don't know. I mean, just give me the word. Um, so how do you make the service inspiring? It's got to be relevant. It's going to answer to the people's needs right now. And you've got to give them the way out, right? Inspiration, all it is, it's saying, hey, you can do this, buddy. I know you're going through a hard time. I know finals are coming up. You know, it's, it's what, well, April, right? It, it, just a couple more months. You know, inspiration can be, school going to be over. Just don't worry about it. Probably not very inspiring. They just, you know, you just give them an excuse not to, do very, not to work very hard. The proper thing is like, hey, it's only a few months left. Finish it strong. You know, roar for people. And I think that's what's exciting. A lot of times, we want people to, to come to the service and we beat them up. Um, and it's okay to be straightforward. It's okay to be honest. It's okay to be like, you know, if you sin, you will die. That's what the Bible says, right? Um, amen, go. Um, you know, uh, you know, you can repent because if you don't, you'll die definitely. You know, today is your last chance. <laughs> I mean, uh, I mean, but, but, but there's always but. But if you do come to Jesus today, you know, you will die and you're going to go to heaven. So you're going to die either way. That's not very inspiring anyway. Um, you know, how can I live forever? 
Oh, you're going to live forever with Jesus. Oh, that's more exciting. So, inspiring. How do we show people that living a Christian life is a good thing? That God is faithful, God is honest, uh, God is fair, God is there for people. I mean, it's so cool. Inspiring service. Um, inspiring service, you really need to think. I, I really like um, John McDonald. And he, he teaches about this in, in this way. He said, when I'm preparing my sermon. I'm sitting in my study room um, behind my desk. And I usually put folding chairs uh, in front of my table. And usually there's uh, six or eight. And on my back wall, I have sticky notes. There are about 30 of them. And every time, every time I preach, uh, prepare another sermon, I just take some six or eight sticky notes, and I go and I put them on the chairs. And those sticky notes written are the people in our church, like single mom with three kids, under, uh, under like, uh, before school kind of kids, young kids. I have a student uh, who is international and just here um, in town for, for this season. Uh, I have elderly couple um, who's going through some medical issues. I have young couple who just uh, lost a child. And he puts them on, their, uh, on these folding chairs. So when he's preparing his sermon, he's like, how can I speak the word in such a way that it applies to their situation? Doesn't matter what my topic is. You know, it's hard uh, when you think about it. You know, when you, when you work with youth, it's kind of, okay, I have this, you know. Within youth, there is diversity of issues that you need to address. How can you address every issue and address if each person? Uh, anxiety, uh, image, you know, uh, and just a, other, um, a lot of other things. How can you inspire people to move on? Give them um, wind under their wings. Give them faith that God is there for them faithfully. You know, that's what it is. Holistic uh, small groups. Um, small groups. And the word holistic, pretty much, it means uh, have a small group that prays for each other, that people are connected. They're connected on all levels. We don't have a lot of friends in the church. Uh, I mean, the reality is um, it's even harder when you're a pastor of the church. I mean, I see people. Um, no, people see me. I mean, the reality is it's kind of funny that, uh, you know, I'm standing here uh, talking to you. Uh, this academy will be over, and we will part away and be some, you know, just uh, places. And then maybe three years from now, uh, probably it's not going to be George that he took, uh, unless I give him help. Um, you know, he's an old man. You know, we're going to get to, to another conference and some of you will come and say, oh, Pastor Peter, hello, so good to see you. And I'll look at you like, who are you? Uh, I mean, I don't know who you are. I mean, like, oh, you remember like three years ago on Monday night in April, you kind of right, right after Easter, you were talking. Oh my God, really, did I? I mean, I don't remember. A lot of people go to church. They sit in the same pew. They don't know each other's names, last name, family, connections, problems, nothing. And they may be going to the church for 20 years and they still don't know each other because they never had a meeting where they could sit down and pray for each other and they no, never opened up to each other about anything. I understand in a big church, maybe it's almost impossible to do, but in a youth group, it's required. Small groups are super important. Uh, people got to live life together. And that, that things, that, that's what makes youth group healthy. It's healthy. Um, We'll talk about healthy uh, options a bit more, but small groups are essential. All growing churches will have some sort of small groups. And when we talk about small groups, see, uh, they don't call them yacheiki, right? Cell groups. Because cell groups, uh, there is like a whole uh, different concept. Uh, it's a church that gathers in cells, you know? It's like, like a hive kind of concept. This one is different. So you can have a volleyball small group, you know, just a bunch of guys go play volleyball, you know, every couple of weeks. What do they do? They see each other, they, they check on each other, how are you, I'm doing fine, what are you doing this Saturday, nothing. Okay, let's play ball. Uh, what's on Sunday? Church, okay, good, let's go. They don't show up on church on Sunday? Where were you? Oh, I don't know, blah, blah, blah. You gotta be holistic, come on buddy, you know, we play volleyball on Saturdays, we see each other on Sunday, that's important. How is life? You know, uh, how is school? You help people. Do you know how you know uh, if a person is your friend? You know, a lot of people say, oh, they're my friend. 
I say, if it's a good friend, it will make you better. If it's a bad friend, it will make you worse. If your friends don't encourage you to be better, they're bad friends, dump, dump them. I mean, for real. If you have a friend who is like a, acts like a jerk and say, hey, come on, read your Bible, dress up, you look like a you know, slug. Come on, buddy, you know, come on, come on, let's go to the church. Let's go to the small group, you know. And you think, man, they're annoying, blah, blah, blah. You know, that's great. Those are the good friends. Holistic groups, good friends, they'll encourage each other to grow. If they like, hey, let, let's just skip the church, let's go to the other church, see like some girls and stuff after church, and you kind of come late, right? At the, you know, but blahadat, right? And how na blahadat papas, right? You know, kansas of You know, bad friends, dumb them. Need-oriented evangelism. We're getting, we're getting close. Uh, Need-oriented. So it's really easy to think, oh, we need to uh, reach out to the community. We gotta do something. I'm saying, really? Maybe. Uh, do something that nobody else does. If you do something that nobody else does, you will have results that nobody else get in. Uh, it's not my phrase, Greg Rochelle. I mean, I love the guy. Uh, he's the guy with, I don't know, he has a lot of time on his hands, I guess, um, to develop a really good say. Need-oriented. What is the need in the community? What is the, need in the what is the need around the church? I mean, can we just like reach out to the local elementary school? I mean, if they have a need. If there is like a line of people to try to work in that elementary school, stay away. I mean, find, find a need. Don't be where everybody goes. Always look. Um, my hobby is photography. I like photography. And one of the rules in photography is uh, when everybody's taking pictures of something, always uh, turn back to them and take a picture of them. Usually that's the picture that's going to get published. Um, because, you know, look at the other side. If you ever photographed sunsets, where do people usually look when the sunset happens? Where the sun going? Best picture is exactly in the opposite direction. That's when you get the warmest, beautiful uh, orange hour. It, it's just like wonderful, you know. Turn around and take a picture of everything that sun is lighting up. That's the beautiful pictures. So think about it. Um, need oriented. A, a lot of times, not when media wants you to be in that where everybody's going, look around. A lot of times, when people are running in one way, there are people that are be left behind. Serve them, and you'll be in a pretty good uh, situation. Okay? Last one. Live in relationships. Live in relationships. How do you define live in relationships? Are you guys in live in relationships with each other? Uh, look around. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure I love those people. So how would you define life in a relationship in your church? Honest. Honest? That's mean. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. I, I like honest people, but not all of them. You know, some of them are too honest, you know. But no, no, that, that is true. That is, that is right, you know. Let me talk about that in a form of marriage. When God created man and a woman, по-русски написано соответствующую ему, да? Сотворил помощницу, соответствующую ему. По-английски как написано? According to him, right? According to him. Not like him, but like according to him. Uh, in uh, Hebrew, it's more like against him. Бог сотворил помощницу против него. Оно по-русски тоже может быть, you know, like, like a reflection, right? Against, against. Но no, no concept is this. Писание говорит, что по жизни, когда мы идем, кто-то из нас будет падать, да? Наклоняться. And you need a person who will lean against them in that moment. So when we talk about love and relationship, when you see a person falling, you will come and you will press on them pushing them the other way. They, a lot of people will say, oh, thank you. A lot of people don't. Not live in relationship is. We will push them farther. Saying, oh, you're leaning, buddy, come on. You know, pick up yourself. You're like, you know, you're leaning this way. You're leaning that way. You know, you're like wobbling all over the place. We are honest. We're telling them. But we are not against them. We're with them. We're pushing them down. So how do you... 
come in a position loving people, pushing them against. You know, that's life in a relationship. It's possible. It's doable. So, how many of you are married here? Okay. Some of you kind of get an idea. Um, you know, see how quiet these guys are? Usually like sit on the side, you know, like uh, outskirts of the thing. Uh, because they know. Um, marriage has nothing to do with like, uh, you know, uh, fuzzy feelings and butterflies. Butterflies die in about two years. You know, that's true. Uh, and uh, not, uh, let me, I'm, I'm talking about this, uh, I'm talking about youth. You know, listen, listen, listen to me, it's very important. Statistically, divorce spikes between year three and five. And then uh, at about age, um, about 30 years into the marriage, between 30 and 40 years of marriage. Do you know why? So about, in about two or three years, your butterflies will die. All these pink glasses wear off. All the emotions will kind of fade out. And you realize you're waking up with another human being who's getting older, getting wrinkled, and getting cranky. You know, and, and they're against you. Bible said God created them against you. And you wake up and you want to, you know, just leave your socks where they are, you know? And she's like, come on, honey, I love you. Pick them up and throw them because you love me too. Like, I love you, but I don't want to, I mean, they're in the right place. I mean, who cares? And, you know, it's like against you, against you. And you're like, honey, I love you, but I don't, I don't like how these flowers stink. You know, they're about to die and they smell like that flower, you know? Can you get rid of them? But, oh, they're so pretty. You know, it's against you. It's like, you're not gonna get a lot of things. You will realize that we're different and it's beautiful. And we're like, you know what? I love my wife, even though she likes flowers that are about to gonna die. If I would give my wife flowers, I would give her life plants. At least there's hope. Uh, you know, dead flowers. I mean, somebody chopped them off. I mean, that, that's mean, I don't know. Loving relationships are number eight. Uh, do you have any questions about these eight topics? Any questions in practical terms, in your youth, uh, anything, 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 just like spill it out. If you come to any questions, you're more than well, uh, welcome to ask them later. Tim, do you have a question? No, go ahead. Gift-oriented ministry, yes. Uh -huh. That's the hardest part of leadership. You know, слово мы это часто говорим. Человек попал не в свое призвание. No, да, да, да. Никто не попадает в призвание, не в свое. Их туда, его туда впихнули, его туда назначили. Это проблема лидерства, которая поставила его неправильную позицию. Сейчас вопрос, как его туда вырвать. И Боже, дай мудрость лидеру, который поставил неправильных людей в неправильное место, потому что сейчас ему нужно самому разбираться с этим. И не хочется никого обидеть, не хочется никого вытянуть, не хочется им как-то сказать, слушай, у тебя не получается, давай кого-то другого заменим. Но, эм, опять, это немножко идея такая, что служение, какая первая фраза, что я сказал вам записать? У Бога нет департамента of unemployment. Иногда мы думаем, если меня назначили руководителем молодежи, я буду руководителем молодежи, моих 78 лет, на wheelchair and a walker, you know, we're gonna come and we're gonna exchange our, you know, dentures with each other, you know, and glasses, you know, and it's gonna be awesome. Come on. Youth leaders has, like, an expiration date on that ministry. Don't, don't like, uh, assume you're gonna be there forever. You're not going to build a career out of youth ministry or Sunday school teachers or, or anything else. As a pastor, I know my time will come and I would have to leave. So don't be afraid to leave. People who tried it, felt it, know kind of things don't work. Say, you know what, uh, pastor, I mean, I, I don't know. It doesn't feel like it's my place. I, I think I'm missing marks. Be honest with me. Am I, am I not uh, achieving? And a lot of times people will say, no, you're fine. You're doing okay. Because they're afraid. Be honest. I mean, just like, you know what? Uh, what do you want to try? Do you want to try something different? What do you think God is calling you to do? What gifts do you think you have? Do you want to take a questionnaire to find your spiritual gift? 
I mean, there, is a, there are questionnaires to find your spiritual gift. You know, find it, say, hey, you know, with this gift, probably you'll be better in this ministry. Try it out. You know, sometimes there are gifts and sometimes there's personality problems. And personality problems come with any forms and shapes. And people with their personality will ruin a lot of gifts that God gave them. So don't mix this up. See, I'm not sure. Rumbling, rumbling, I'm like angry, yeah, right there. Угу. Все меняемся. Смотри, this is, это не модель. Это, это не модель, это принципы. А модель нельзя а, трансформировать в другую культуру. Принципы можно. Смотри. А, найти. Опять, все создается в культуре, да? Культуре церкви. Если в культуре церкви создается идея, что есть более высокие служения и более низкие служения, тогда очень тяжело двигать людей в обратную сторону. Да? То есть, вот, ну, допустим, кто в церкви важнее? Секретарь и трежер или директор воскресной школы? То есть, ну, секретарь и трежер – это больше административная, финансовая, Человек, секретарь, трежер в церкви, или там, board, uh, chair of directors, chair of board of directors, да, или председатель церковного совета, uh, will have a lot of say. Влияет на пастора, влияет на, на структуру, влияет. И потом есть uh, директор воскресной школы. Директор воскресной школы может быть пастором, да, you know, kids ministry pastor, right? Um, и этот человек влияет на, на следующее поколение. Он работает с родителями всех детей. Именно самая активная часть церкви – это родители, у кого маленькие дети, которые жертвуют много. И от директора воскресной школы много зависит. Директор воскресной школы повел себя неправильно. Люди ушли из церкви. Вся церковь завалилась. Воскресная школа работает, церковь растет, развивается. И пастор говорит, что он прекрасный пастор, потому что его хорошие проповеди. Нет, просто детская программа чудесно работает. И родители привозят своих детей. So, Вопрос, если оно на самом деле gift-oriented, и люди в правильном месте, и структура allows them to work, потому что бывает прекрасный пастор в детском служении, но его рубят. Бывает молодежная программа, начинает расти, быстро говорят, У, эм, это too much, it's outside, мы, мы уже боимся, потому что наша структура сейчас, она уже не выдерживает размер молодежи или молодежного роста. You know, it's like, начинается эм, not functional, она начинается структура, чтобы удержать людей. И я говорю, структура, которая удерживает, это структура, которая разваливает. Правильно? Does make sense? So, um, и, um, so вопрос, как это сделать, чтобы... Смотри, мы, мы сейчас говорим вот, ну, с вами, правильно? Об этом же мы иногда говорим э, с пасторами. С пасторами мы говорим об этом на другом языке. Потому что э, написать многим пасторам э, концепт, они выросли, как Тим говорит, в другом, в другом мире, в другой среде, в другой культуре. Для них это намного тяжелее. Поэтому, когда мы говорим за следующее поколение, и я сейчас буду говорить с вами о том, how can you influence your pastor? Потому что для меня очень важно. Um, let, me, let me answer that question. Uh, через couple слайдов. Можно? Let me answer, uh, I'll go through this slide first. Сколько у нас времени? 15 минут, да, мы должны закончить. Uh, yeah, Um, to the point that this person is so busy that 
upset your life mm -hmm. and what. But how can that be possible? How can you tell a pastor? How can you say, like, hey, I, I need a couple of months just to like, get back to like normal, balanced life? Uh, that's one question. And the next one is regarding small groups. Um, so young people, teens, uh, even kids, but not just teens, um, there's a huge number of kids who are, I can't, they're not introverted, but they're literally, uh, I don't know, they have, don't have obvious interests. They don't have, their, they don't socialize. They're stuck at home, they have all kinds of things, but they, they uh, it's very hard to uh, get them to join an active group or what, um, without uh, doing too much one-on-one -on -one with these people and trying to figure out, you know, this and that. Is, is, that, is there any other way to be more efficient to like get to organize, to get them to be part of some kind of group or to create, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So I'll ask my son, Philip. Um, Philip is 16. So how do you uh, get uh, kids who are introverted, um, kind of 15, 16, you know, uh, freshman, sophomore high school, middle school, uh, maybe even, um, to get involved in a small group even if they, like, they don't see, they don't have a lot of interest in being involved. Well, what would you do? Be friend first. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, each age. I mean, I, 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 I was 17 when I came to the United States. I don't understand a lot of kids who are born here, um, because I mean, oh man, it's it's tough. Um, how many of you play uh, computer games on a regular basis? Yeah. You know, I mean, come on, someone must be chesting. How many of you play games? Like you have a, a gaming computer at home. You have a gaming computer at home. Okay. No, 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 no. no it's it's okay. Um, um, if if you <laughs> sorry, там другие камеры, надеюсь, что они не пишут нас. No, think about it. You know, um, sometimes. Uh, how many of you like watched all Star Wars? All, all of the all the seasons. Okay, some of you did. You know, some. Um, I'm just. The reason I'm asking. The reason I'm asking. You know, a lot of times uh, I need to like read up on Star Wars or on like Minecraft or something. I need to Google to find out to even like what what is Minecraft? I mean, what, what do they do? What are they trying to build? You know, so I can ask a question. You know, it, it's important to to at least you know get involved. I mean. I, I was trying to play games like 20 years ago. I would lose every single time, and I thought, I don't want to be a loser in life, so I decided not to play. You know, so um, I started preaching, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Try to play my game. <laughs> you know, just kidding. Um, so what was the first question? <laughs> About break. Bra breakout, uh, burnout. So very, um, man, So everybody will get to the point when we are tired. Tired doesn't mean it's bad. I mean, I get tired. Uh, I have full-time ministry, I have full-time job, I have family, um, and I love it. You know, some Sundays I come home, you know, I'm driving from Portland, um, you know, and I'm like, this is like so awesome. This is like so beautiful. I'm so tired, I'm gonna sleep like a baby. Uh, my wife will wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning and say, quit snoring, buddy, you're like, you're like a, you know, I'm sleeping with a bear. I'm like, it's just because I'm so tired. But when you love what you do, um, there, there got to be a moment to recharge. Uh, my calendar is busy, and I think all pastors' calendars are very, very busy. But I think, um, how do you manage time? What recharges you? I don't need a lot of time to recharge. I need to have a good night's sleep. And then, um, I mean, I like nature, so sometimes I go in my backyard, 
It's a very small backyard. I have a coffee and I watch uh, hummingbirds, mm, you know, drink whatever we gave them and they're happy and I'm happy and it takes 20 minutes to like, wow, that was a good day. That, that, that's all, that, that's all I needed. Um, and, you know, sometimes like today um, I had to work, I had to uh, attend funeral and I'm teaching here today. Um, it's like, and I have a full-time job, so I grab my job with me, I grab a car, and today I parked in a park in, on the other side of the Columbia, uh, found a little community park, watched uh, the Columbia River flow, and, and worked for three hours. Man, that was like the best three hours of my life. You know, that's why I have so much energy and I had, didn't have a lot of coffee today, so mm, it recharges. I mean, I'm fine in that time. I mean, I could have stayed home. I could have found a reason to complain. Um, it's not going to help. So, um, so the question is probably like a reward for good work is more work. And uh, learning to say no sometimes is appropriate. That's next slide. So let me, let me answer this question going here. What pastor wants you to know? I don't want to, uh, I think it's Schwartz is talking about this concept. God did not create it. A pig with long fur uh, that lay eggs and give milk. Um, a lot of times that's what we want to be. We want to be the pig with long fur um, that lay eggs and give milk. You know, everything. You know, we want to be like, you know, what is your calling? What, what, what God wants you to be? You know, uh, you know, I am a pastor, and I figure out when I'm a pastor, I cannot be the sound guy, I can be the, not be the video guy, I cannot be the usher, I cannot be anything else except me. And I'm content with me. And I tell people, and I'm telling you, you know, as a leaders, you guys figure out what only you can do. And do only things that you can do. A lot of times, like, mm, but I can do this too because people who I ask to do other things, they're not doing it as good as me. You know, and that is the problem not with you. It's problem with empowering leadership. We are bad leaders. I think bad leaders will burn out faster than good leaders. I mean, good leaders um, will be tired. Don't, don't get me wrong. Um, you know, preaching... Um, you know, six, seven, eight services. You know, some churches have eight services a week or, or on Sunday. I mean, that's, that will wear anybody out. You know, think about the worship team who uh, has to play and sing four or five songs every service. I mean, at the end of the weekend, uh, drummers, you know, probably need to have a ice bath, you know, for their arms to, to cool off and legs hurt. I mean, you, you know uh, who play, you know, you know who sing. Yeah, and you're not going to talk for two days uh, after you sing the, you know, a long weekend. You need to kind of recover for that. It's okay. But you are more important than what you do. Uh, and pastors want you to know. I don't want to find out that person is like on a verge of break um, when it's like really verge of break. You know, talk to me. You know, say, hey, um, pastor, um, I want to go on vacation. And you probably should have a vacation. You should be allowed to be to skip, you know, how many percent? Ten percent of all youth services? Out of fifty, how many is that? Five, six, seven a year? It's probably okay. You know. 
Go with your family. Family go on vacation, um, ask somebody else to lead and go. It's okay. You don't have to be like the person. I mean, in reality, God never appointed us to hold the world on our shoulders. It's not our job. He did it. I mean, he's doing it. So why um, we are, you are more important. You are more important than what you do. I mean, in reality, I like you, and I don't know what you're doing. Maybe not, some of you don't even do anything. You just come to the classes, and we already like you. You know, that, that's pretty cool, you know. Come, sit here, enjoy. Uh, because that, a lot of times, um, we want to define ourselves by our achievements. Um, and there is no leader who doesn't fail once in a while. We're all going to fail. And some of us will fail miserably. Um, you know, I know friends, pastors, uh, who in the last uh, COVID uh, season uh, closed their churches. You know, and it feels like they're failed. They didn't raise the church to be strong and mature to endure the COVID, you know, challenges. People left. People never came back. You know, like Portland, a lot of people moved from, from Portland to another state. And some pastors and Peter, I lost 30% of my church. 30%? That is painful. That is painful. Um, you can blame yourself. But um, could pastor do anything else about it? He is bigger and better than the results of his ministry. God appoint him for this season and he will pastor this church in a time of change and he will be okay on the other side same thing with youth you will go uh, through seasons and some youth will grow up and move on and it's like where is my youth they all got married i have all these kids now that i don't know uh, who they are okay you're gonna raise another uh, generation of leaders you have to build your new worship team you have to start from scratch again it happens, but you are more important than what you do. Just be faithful. Now, be real. Uh, Greg Rochelle, yeah. people, the, yes. Oh, break time? Yes, break time. We'll come back to this. Um, yeah, yeah, so we'll, we'll uh, probably, so I have a few more slides. I just want to unload them on you quickly, and then I'm just going to sit down and I'll ask, I'll let you ask questions, and we'll just have a conversation. I don't have all the answers um, Jesus does. Um, <laughs> and I'm not Jesus. Um, what pastors want you to know? You are more important than what you do. Um, we love you just the way you are. We really appreciate everything you do. Anything you do is already a great help. And that's how it really is. Um, a lot of pastors, and I'm not the exception, we don't say a lot of good words to people uh, who serve. We kind of like when things are done, and when they're not done, we say, come on, people, <laughs> chop, chop, chop. Things got to get done, because we want to have excellence. Excellence is important. And then we ask people who do excellent work in one area, we ask them to do excellent job in other areas, and they do everything. And then we have a bunch of other people who do absolutely nothing and everybody's happy until we lose those few people. And when we lose those few people, we create crisis and we go through crisis management and we look for the next uh, target and we put them in this place and we burn them out. And that's kind of how the normal system works. So it's not normal. Uh, it should be different. And that's the reason why we're here. Uh, in a healthy church, in a healthy group, in a healthy environment, everybody knows what they're doing and there is enough work for them um, to do and be happy with it. Uh, it. It's okay. I mean, it does mean that there will be no pain. Pain is given. Um, you know, discouragement is given. Criticism is given. Um, but that does not define who you are. And if you want to serve in any capacity, prepare yourself for suffering. You know, that's Bible. Uh, you know, suffering is part. Sorry, guys, uh, my phone. That's kind of weird. I hear things when I should. 
I don't want to turn this off. Anyway, we have our leaders meeting uh, every Monday at 8.30. Uh, our service planning team, about a dozen people, gathers on Zoom call and they just uh, chat about how Sunday went and they plan next Sunday. Um, so that's what we do. If you hear them, I'm so sorry. Be real you. We like people who are real. Uh, I uh, honestly don't like people who have like faces, like, you know, church face and then their, you know, their non-church face. Um, you know, it's kind of funny that you have uh, really cool guys who can preach very well and then you play volleyball with them and they're like biggest jerks. Um, you know, they, they would say like bad words. They get like all upset. They're like call the fall when there is no fall. It's like, come on, buddy, just like be cool, you know, be humble, you know. Jesus is watching, you know, it's not your job to call faults, you know. Um, but they want to win, you know. So winning at any price is not Christian character, right? And I'm okay. So if you're like jerk when you play volleyball, you know, be a jerk at church. At least we know who should come to repentance when we call, uh, you know, people to the altar call, right? Uh, but, but people learn to play. And I say, leaders are not allowed to play games. Can we say amen? You cannot play games. Be you. We like you the way you are. You know, it's okay. It's okay uh, to be you. Um, you know, um, but you always should improve. You always should be better. I know. Uh, uh, so be an example. That's Paul talks to Timothy. He's saying, be an example. Don't let people look at you as a young person, right? Despise your youth. Young people are not dumb people. Can we say amen? A lot of young people are very smart, very talented, very uh, techy. I mean, they're just awesome, awesome. They just need to be given opportunity to serve. But I think there are still a lot of areas of improvements in their speech, right? I know I need to improve my speech. I, I said a lot of words that probably you don't even know. Um, and guess what? It's okay. You know, I'll, I'll improve. I'll be better. Um, conduct. Uh, Good thing Philip is here. He will not allow me to lie. You know, sometimes I need to improve my conduct still, you know, and Philip is too. Right. Yeah, right there. And so faith. So let me, let me ask, how can you be an example of speech? I understand, right? Everybody got that one? Conduct? Okay. How about faith? How would you define you as an example of faith? In normal life circumstances. Um, okay. Um, give me a couple of those. Give me a couple normal life situations when you need to be an example of faith. Somebody, come on. You lose your job and you're trying to you know, figure out how to make ends meet. If you live with parents, it's pretty easy, right? You just ask mom. And <laughs> That's it. If yeah. you're under that grace. <laughs> grace, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Faith is limited. No, but in that, in you show, you know, you, you testify and, and, and people know that, but mm -hmm. they see how you trusted God in that situation. Yeah. Very Amen. Situation. Okay. Job. Job is one. What else? Come on, there gotta be more than this. Is that the only area where you need faith in real life? Health. health. You guys shouldn't think about health. You guys like gonna live another 120 years. Um, but yes, it's it's good. It's good to trust God in health. Uh, probably older people beginning to understand that more. I had a cataract surgery on my eye a couple of years ago. I'm like, I shouldn't be that old to have that kind of surgery, you know? Guess what? Time comes and you have to like lay down on the, you know, that. Um, how about, let me, I'll share two stories. How about you have a girl in your youth group whose expiration date uh, is nearing its end. She's like 16 and a half, and she doesn't have a boyfriend yet. <laughs> and she is in like, and she is in like a depression. Nobody loves her. You know, um, she's trying to look uh, older, you know, and mama doesn't let her cut her hair or something, you know, make her like wear uh, lipstick that is not like bright red, but something more like toned down. 
and her nails are not long enough or strong enough or some other thing. You know, and this person um, sings on your worship team, you know, in a youth service because they're already, you know, very talented. You know, nobody despises their youth, but they really struggle with faith because they don't know how to deal because a lot of her girlfriends already have boyfriends and she's kind of left behind. And she's singing about Jesus, how he knows all the, you know, problems and he's like, like waves, you know, what's that, you know, oceans kind of thing, you know, the roar and things. And it's like, and she doesn't know how to deal with it. How can she be an example of faith? Should she? I think she should. She should. I think the guys should be the guys of faith. I mean, I'm talking about pre-marriage stuff. I don't know why um, it's probably needed. So here it is. A lot of times when we think about relationships in a youth setting, we think about, oh, it's, it's so much better to be with someone. Bible said it's not good for man to be alone, right? So is it better to be together? Yeah, Bible kind of said so, so. But it's only true when you allow faith to work in your life. If, you, if God give you a partner, it's better with God's partner. If you choose your own, it's not necessarily it's going to be good, right? You probably, you're not old enough to know a lot of things, but you already seen marriages that have been broken, lives ruined. You've seen violence and abuse in, in, in young, you know, in kids in our like youth groups, and you wonder why. Faith need to be an exercised. Trust God. Pray about it. Don't jump the gun, you know. Don't, don't go and date somebody. I just want to have somebody. Somebody is not the one that God wants. Be an example of it. Be an example of purity. Show love. Love means sacrifice. Very important. Youth leaders need to show love by doing the work that nobody else, nobody wants to do. Comprende? If there is something that nobody else wants to do, if there is like person that nobody wants to talk to, be an example of love. Say, I'll do it. This is the easiest way to get successful in ministry. Easiest way to get success in ministry is doing the work that nobody else is doing. And suddenly you're the best person in that ministry. Right? Got it? Any questions? I want you to know probably a few things more, but if you know that, we love you guys. You're already awesome. Keep doing it. Keep pushing it. How to build a relationship with your pastor. Um, it's, it, a lot of things is about communication. Greg Rochelle, I spoke about him a couple times already. Um, uh, just uh, go to YouTube, type Greg Rochelle Leadership Podcast. Listen. He's awesome on leadership. Um, good stuff. I find it, it's applicable to a Christian world and not Christian world. It's, it's good even for people in business. Greg is awesome. Um, Life Church. He's, a, he's pastor in Life Church. I think they have probably 30 campuses. And if you, does your phone has like a Bible app on it? Is that a U version app? That's them. Their church developed it for free. I mean, and they're sharing it with everybody. Um, Greg Rochelle, that's what he does. Um, uh, good, good guy. Um, so five things matters when you're leading up. So um, in our first um, uh, session, on the first slide, we were talking about, um, you know, um, I think, Tim, you, you raised that issue. You know, you have this culture of older Slavic um, churches and that brought the culture you know from the former soviet union and the culture of the church and culture of the ministry of the relationships uh, and how the systems are built um, and then you have next generation like you guys you work in american corporate world you finish uh, education you have education you know you have bachelor's in business and management and you come to church and you see how church board uh, manage their minutes 
And you're like, oh God, who's doing the finances? You know, how, they, how can they even come close to anything? You know? And you see how they manage construction. It's like, this is not project management. It's like a, a risk mitigation in the worst way you know, possible. How, how do you do that? So how do you lead up? When you have the knowledge and you think you have better idea, how do you communicate to a pastor who is older? And here it is, five principles. Honor matters. Your pastor, even if he's old, he's not dumb. Say amen. Uh, your pastor is a servant of God. God appointed him. He was there for the long time. He was serving the church faithfully. He's a good man of God. He's in his area of ministry, and he's wonderful. He doesn't, he cannot be everything. He doesn't, he should not know all the finances. He does know the project management, but a lot of times, you know, uh, uh, Pastor Ivan Holub, we were at the church, right? So most likely the moment came and какой-то церковный совет сидел и решал, what should we do with the building we have? And they said, Pastor Ivan, should we buy the new church or not? And Pastor Ivan have to like say his opinion. Like, is he a realtor? Does he know the market? I mean, can he do market research? Does he know how the finances work? Should he know? He's a pastor. I mean, he can preach the gospel and can visit sick people and pray for them. I mean, that's what the Bible teaches. But the weight is there. So, um, and a lot of people come and say, come on, pastor, our lawn is uh, not mowed and, and our bosses are getting old and somebody need to change the oil on them for crying out loud. You know, it's like, oh, really? I mean, our youth went to mission trip and they didn't sign the, you know, release forms. It's risk, you know, we're, we're gonna get sued for a million dollars. And the pastor's like, what? I just prayed for them and asked God to protect them. Go away, you know, I mean. <laughs> <clears throat> Your pastor is an awesome guy. God appointed the pastors. And they're there for a period of time. They're there for a season. And if you honor pastors you have um, publicly for the ministry they already did, um, it already uh, allows you to have influence on them. Okay? Want to have influence? Honor your pastor. Pastor will listen to you if you're nice to your pastor. They're humans too. I will listen to you if you're nice to me. There you go. Timing matters. Timing. Very important. Everybody has a rhythm of life. You, you mentioned, you know, uh, somebody needs to have a time off or, um, you know, burn out. I have my rhythm of life. Some people don't sleep at night. You know, and they like to talk at night to pastors. You know, about all their world problems, how bad the nursery is. Come on, give the guy a break. It's 7 o'clock in the evening on Wednesday night. He's having dinner with his family. You know, call him in the morning around 10. You know, he'll be done with his breakfast, done with his Bible study, and he'll be able to talk to you. Timing. Just figure out the rhythm. Just like, I mean, just use your brains, you know, kind of thing. It, it's helpful. A lot of times, a lot of times people don't. Um, uh, there is another, there are another group of people who think, oh, our pastor is so, so busy, so busy, he will never find time for me. That is not true. We want to find time, we want to listen, we want to spend time with you. Send us a text message, a call, and say, hey, pastor, I want to talk to you. Can we schedule some time? Schedule that time. When you come to a meeting with your pastor, come prepared. Say, Pastor, I want to talk to you about three things. I want to talk about nursery, the bus, for our mission trip, and the budget for something else. Most likely, is this pastor's business? You know, if it's a bus, the budget, you know, you can talk to me, go ahead, but probably need to um, go to talk to people who can help you. But if you want to talk about something else, you're more than welcome to. But I'm willing to listen about anything. You know, I want to know. So, come. Uh, keep it short, keep to the point, um, and spend time getting to know pastor. Uh, I think um, spending time is super important, especially when you're in the leadership position. A lot of times people go to pastor um, when uh, things go bad. Third, motives matter. 
So a lot of times we can go to pastor because we have a great idea. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Great idea need to be communicated somehow. But sometimes we go, I'm just going to go and I'm going to tell pastor everything I think about them because what a, you know, old group of people who have no idea what they're doing. Let, let me tell them, let me teach them. Wrong, not going to work, right? Not going to work. If you want to lead up, you got to come and say, hey guys, you're doing a great job. I like the way you did services, the way you prayed. I see God working in these areas. But I think video ministry, I'm going to pick on you, I mean, because this is kind of cool. Uh, video ministry is like, uh, you know, uh, being neglected. And I think we can reach every Sunday about 1,000 people, even though we have only 400 people here, but we can reach 1,000 people every Sunday service with our um, broadcast. And um, can, I, can I tell you, can I share how it's done? Pastor will look and will feel that you are... So what is the proper motive? Proper motive is when you say, I want to help, expand, achieve goal of the church. Well, goal of organization. I want to help to achieve the goal of organization. A lot of times people say, oh, our church doesn't have any goals. That is not true. And that is, if you ask your pastor, uh, he'll say, yeah, uh, why, why are we gathering? I don't know. No, the pastor doesn't say that, right? Oh, we just like to hang out together, right? You know, I'm here to, to marry, marry people, you know, I have nothing better to do. It's not what pastors are doing, right? They have goals. They, they're ministry goals. Uh, they're leading people to Christ. I mean, there, there is a spiritual growth. They, they want to, uh, I mean, I, I really like, um, I recently I heard a sermon and it was said this way. Um, one pastor said, my goal is to prepare people for eternity. And I'm like, that's a, a big goal. How do you do that? or through uh, finding proper gifts, through leadership, through uh, inspiring services, through life and relationship, through small groups. We're preparing people for eternity because we want people to get there and we want to find them wherever they are and get them to be like Jesus wants them to be. You know, we want to pass them on. That is the process. So if you come and you say, Pastor, how can I be by your side and I want to help our church to be more successful, we want to reach more people. I know exactly what that is. Uh, can we do this with the tech ministry? And pastor will say, oh, man, I don't even know what you're talking about. Well, what is that thing with these things? You know, it's gonna look uh, ugly. It's like, it's gonna ru ruin the aesthetics of our building. It's like, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll listen to you. I still wanna do it. How can we reach out to more people? You know, explain, talk, talk, talk. Uh, pastor Banyetsky, he's a, a really cool guy. And he would say, Peter, um, I mean, I, I always had a ton of ideas. Uh, some of them were good, uh, a lot of them were not. Um, but he would listen. And he would listen and listen and listen and listen and say, Peter, I don't understand. I'm like, okay, can we schedule another lunch? Uh, I'll try to prepare my speech in, a, in a, using different words. He's like, oh, okay, okay, fine. So we get again, you know, in a couple of weeks, and I say, okay, so let me explain that. And he's like, oh, okay. Oh, you're just, and he would use some other word that makes sense to him. And he'll say, so you're talking about this? I'm like, yeah. Like, oh, конечно, это моя идея была. Я всегда это хотел, чтобы было. Like, а что мне раньше не сказали? Я просто не знал, как он называется. Я говорил, просто вы не понимали. I'm like, oh. So, motives. Sometimes we come with a great idea, but we don't really listen. And we want to, you know, we think we're smarter. And we want to outsmart our pastors. And they come, come with a humble Expansion of the ministry. Initiative matters. So initiative is a very in interesting thing. Um, how do you explain initiative? I would explain initiative this way. If you see the problem, come with a solution. Okay? If you see the problem, come with a solution. And not just a solution for the pastor to do, or, or some other. Братья, вам надо срочно заняться вот этим делом. 
да? Like, кому надо заняться, братья? And, да, то есть вот, вот I mean, всегда же так. Пастор, ты должен идти поговорить вот с тем человеком, да? Пастор, ты должен точно вот там идти поругать молодежь. Пастор, ты должен идти посмотреть, как загадили детскую комнату. You know, like, great idea. А ты можешь сам пойти посмотреть? Ну, и сделать так, чтобы она не была загажена, и потом рассказать, какая она уже чистая. I mean, that would be awesome. You know, show me some initiative and take, take the weight off my shoulders. So, that's how relationships with pastors are being built. So, we're talking about pastors are humans. Um, so, I want to talk about timing another time. <laughs> I think... Um, There was time, um, uh, one person complained uh, to me, like, years later, saying, Peter, I, I can never talk to you. You seem like you're always ignoring me when I talk to you about something very important. And I'm like, I'm so sorry. I mean, that, that's like, uh, <laughs> you know. Uh, I thought I was very caring, loving, and, you know, uh, listening kind of pastor. He said, w when did we talk? I mean. О, oh, еще, не помнишь, вот, вот э, в воскресенье вечером после собрания мы шли по коридору, вот и, ага, uh, seriously, в воскресенье после собрания по коридору я должен быть, э, не знаю, каким-то особенным таким вот, ну, чтобы услышать все идеи, и сердце, и душу. It's not gonna work. Set the time aside. So if you want to talk about something important to a pastor, find a time when pastor is like sitting down, bring him coffee, you know, look in, the, in their eyes and say, how are you, brother? Ask that one question first. And just listen. And if you don't give them the answer, most likely they're not going to hear you. Because they need to just breathe in and just breathe out. And then they'll be able to listen to you. So timing in that. So timing and initiative. Honor, timing, motives, initiative, truth. Um, we want to say truth to our pastors. You know, truth matters. But at the same time, we want to allow pastor to say truth to us. Say, hey, you're doing a great job, but I really want you to kind of focus on this area too. And you're like, oh, come on, pastor, I don't want to talk to the young No, come on, can I talk to the young people? Can I talk to the young people? And he says, I understand. You can talk to the young people, but you can talk to the young people so that they can look nice and so that it won't be hurt, because they are going to be in every professional society for young people. That's honest, right? Cover pastor's back. I mean, come on. You say, hey, молодежь, мы любим нашего пастора, приходим на собрание, но, но давайте так, чтобы не как бомжи, хоть, хоть чуть-чуть, you know? Те, которые приходят, ну, неверующие, guys, don't worry about them. Ни белых рубашек, ни длинных платьев, ни костюмов. And we're not talking about this. Just, just look normal, okay? Kind of, kind of just like, хоть чуть-чуть, you know? Uh, help me out. I'm trying to build a relationship with pastor, and we need to work. We need to be on the same page. That's real. That's true. If we don't listen, nothing going to happen. Um, truth works both ways. Мы слушаем то, что пастор говорит. Он говорит то, что у него на сердце. Мы говорим то, что у нас на сердце. Подумайте о себе, когда вы в лидерской позиции вашей группы. Лидеры они часто имеют классные идеи. Uh, большие идеи, великие идеи. Для них нужно много ресурсов и много людей. Но uh, иногда люди говорят, слушай, Питер, uh, смотря на нашу команду, мы не потянем этот проект. У нас нет ресурсов, потому что у нас вот три служения перед этим, три служения после. Мы не можем добавить кемпи на миру. We are getting ready. Но я же пастор, да, я же лидер, мне же хочется, нужно там что-то, с... вот так. И я могу просто переехать через моих ребят, и они сделают то, что я их попрошу. И они будут молчать в следующий раз. Когда я буду искать honest opinion, они просто промолчат, говорят, Peter didn't listen to us. We did it, but he didn't care. Uh, и я боюсь, как пастор, я говорю, Господь, I want to be open to the point, uh, чтобы лидеры могли со мной быть Brutally honest. I want to hear their honesty. Потому что если я потеряю этот момент, я окружу себя людьми, которые will not talk to me. Они будут мне льстить, они меня поднимут и потом меня уронят. And that's not what I want to be. 
So build your youth group the same way. Be honest. Just listen in. Um, don't listen to like you know crazy desires like hey can we like just do some uh, silly stuff. But if they're like honestly talking to you, listen in. Okay. Any questions about can you reach out to your pastor using these five principles? Is it possible? Doable? Was it helpful? Okay. A uh, couple more things. Uh, lead. Huh? То есть пастор игнорирует. Да, да, да. То есть всегда нужно начать сначала. То есть чаще, почему оно написано последним? Потому что иногда пастор боится правды. Он боится правды, потому что где-то он не уверен в мотивах. Да, он говорит, да, они говорят, потому что они меня потиживают. Или они говорят это, потому что они видят что-то. То есть он уже через свою призму смотрит. Иногда инициатива не видна. Они, он говорит, ну, ну что, говорили, но ну, этот говорит, и тот говорит, и этот говорит. Уже все говорят, все говорят, что что-то надо менять. Ну, ну, ну и надо менять. Ну, ну а что менять? А как менять? Я, я уже не могу менять. А, что там менять? То есть, иници... То есть, есть описывается проблема, но не дается решение проблем, в которой пастор имеет роль какую-то. Um, it's tough, um, it's tough. Um, опять, если интересно, послушай Грег Рошел. Uh, там лидерский подкаст, он затрагивает вопросы критики, критицизма. Um, I mean, a lot of things. Um, есть интересная книга, если интересно, um, Unstuck Church. Uh, Unstuck Church. Um, она говорит о том, что у церкви есть семь этапов, три роста, три uh, падения и один такой... Uh, который держит э, церковь flourishing. И э, вопрос, бывают моменты и у церкви, и у лидерства, когда церковь перевалила, э, и она уже не способна revive. То есть это, 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 это цикл. И этому циклу мы все подвержены. То есть мы можем пропустить момент и, и сказать, что мы довольны, и я не хочу никого слышать. Оно работает, оно идет. И э, там уже нужно... Э, ну, заводить заново. Всегда есть риск приститься к пастору, всегда есть риск поменять пастора, церковь поменять, или полиция возле пастора, всегда есть риск вот эти ярлыковые какие-то люди рядом, но, в принципе, всегда есть риск. Конечно. И поэтому вот мы, мы сейчас говорим о том, а как даже когда ситуация может быть таксик, нездоровая, как все равно прийти в доверие пастору, так, чтобы на него влиять. То есть мы говорим leading up, да? Потому что все равно э, у каждой церкви есть своя динамика. И она, она может быть э, токсичная, да? то есть она может быть плохая. Там есть э, какие-то на, ну, наслойки прошлые, которые даже мы даже не знаем, они, они просто есть. Ну, и это же есть не только в церкви, это есть в семьях, правильно? В родствах. Мы просто не понимаем, почему какие-то там дяди или тети, они друг, друг с другом не дружат. Мы не знаем почему, но просто что-то не так. Вот. Или там любимчики есть какие-то. Но когда ты в лидерстве, да, твоя задача не работать... Помните, мы говорили, оно все работает море. Move organization where, where it needs to go. Правильно? Мы не удовлетворяем потребности пастора, людей, групп. Мы двигаем церковь в правильном направлении. А какое направление церкви? Мы хотим, чтобы люди спасались, чтобы они духовно росли, чтобы они готовились к вечности. И вот, вот если мы, мы и честно, честны, абсолютно честны с собой, э, мы говорим, Господь, я, я реально хочу, чтобы люди спасались. Я реально хочу, чтобы наши молодые люди развивались духовно. Я реально хочу, чтобы твои дары действовали. Я реально хочу, ну вот, реально, без, без э, примеси, без политики, без ничего, просто реально. И к пастору приходишь, Возьмет год, 20 встреч, 30 встреч. И через какое-то время придет момент, когда оно... It will click. И uh, он скажет, знаешь, uh, I see your faithfulness. Нормально, I move. Я даю тебе право двигаться в твоей инициативе, потому что я доверяю тебе. Uh, знаешь. Или скажешь, знаешь, I, I don't. Pastor and us, I think that in youth ministry, it's 
especially kind of from even from your examples, it ends up being that between, let's say, pastor and then the youth, or just in general people, there's that gas usually that, that youth leader. You know, the pastor comes to the youth leader and he's like, hey, like you said, you know, talk about clothing. And then the youth comes to you and they're like, hey, talk to the pastors about clothing. So to what extent, that, that's just an example that you use, but in this relationship, at what point as a pastor do you think that as a youth leader, I should be like, hey, you know what, stop bugging me about this question, or even to the pastor, like, hey, pastor, you've asked me, we've spoken, we've, whatever the question is, whatever the, you know, ideas are, at what point do you kind of step off to the side and you say, hey, pastor, go build a relationship with them, or do you tell them, hey, go build a, a relationship with the pastor, not, not in a condescending way, like, yeah, I'm done, like, you guys figure it out, but in a way of, like, you don't want to be the only person with a with that relationship. So mm -hmm. how how can you help the youth that looks up to you mm -hmm. that asks you be like, hey, step out of your comfort zone. Go, mm -hmm. go talk to them. Go spend some time. Honor. I think it starts with inviting a pastor to youth events. You know, um, it, it's kind of youth likes to be by themselves. And they're saying, oh, pastor, if pastor comes, you know, it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be awkward. And it surely can get awkward if pastor lost connection. He, he's not there with them very much. So I think uh, I would really appreciate youth uh, leaders or youth pastors um, invitation t to a youth services just for fun of it. Say, hey, pastor, we have a barbecue. Can you come over? You know, can you just like, we're going to go to the camp, you know, not, not to preach. You know, uh, don't worry about preaching. We have preachers better than you, you know. Just can you, like, um, can you just, like, play volleyball with us? You know, can you just, like, hang out with us by the fire? And I think that that's what we, we want more. Um, it, it's hard. You know, a lot of times, again, it's like, um, pastor is busy. You know, and I think timing is matter, matter. But it's like, pastor, you know, can, you know here's, like, we want to talk about these issues, you know, can, can you come and can you just hang out? We, we don't want you like to come to the service and leave right after the service. We want you to be there. And, and, and then you kind of say, hey, pastor will be there next three days. Go talk to him. He's available, you know, and that's cool. So a lot of times somebody needs to make that connection, make that appointment. That's kind of how uh, I would see it. So, um, a very, <coughs> very interesting thing that um, um, a couple of years ago, our church, um, I don't know who came up with this idea. Uh, in October, it's like a pastor's appreciation month uh, or something, cl clergy appreciation month. Did you guys heard about this? You know, so like a third weekend or second weekend of October. And so, I don't know who came up with that idea. In our church, they um, um, asked people to... Um, sign like thank you cards they just pass out a bunch of thank you cards and ask people to fill them up uh, it was like so cool i think uh, my wife and i were sitting down um, after church uh, and just going through them uh, reading it was so nice you know i mean you don't hear a lot of uh, things that god did through your sermon or you know other things uh, you don't get feedback and that feedback was um, cool i think uh, going to back to the small groups uh, and visiting the small groups and listening how they talk and how uh, they enjoy service and how God spoke to them encourages uh, uh, to serve even more. Uh, and so, it softens the heart for the young people. And hmm? like this understanding and connection happens. They actually come and they don't talk about church for all of a sudden. They come and they just like, first they say, thank you, that was so nice that you guys did that. And they listen to you more. Something happens that 
that mm-hmm. was like, it takes a couple of those months, but even one time, gratitude and specifically mm-hmm. saying, seeing, okay, uh, like you are, your prayer ministry on Tuesday nights, we came, a couple of people came with this, and now God answered prayer. And it's just like, then just like you said, just hearing that, it just, it, uh, mm-hmm. they kind of like uh, start rearranging their script. Mm-hmm. And they actually talk to youth like and try to see them and understand and or just sit there and, and be with them. Yeah, it ma'am. Makes a huge difference. So I kinda I wanna flip the table and go to the youth leaders. Uh, how can you do that to your leaders, youth leaders, Sunday school uh, directors? You know, how can you lower that uh, to the point when, when if you're in a position of leadership, um, you know, how do you allow people? How do you teach them? You know, um, uh, so one of the things that I learned about timing when people talk to me, you know, about anything, you know, church is over. As soon as it's over, somebody comes to me and says, Peter, I want to talk to you. The first thing I do, I pull the chair. Grab the chair. Okay. Sedis. Any of the tipo, no, 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 book, one minute. I go, no, right there. Когда я сижу с кем-то разговаривай, nobody interrupts us. As soon as I stand up, somebody else will come. Uh, so and th- that, 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 that is a little trick um, that, that helps me to be, um, you know, create time for that person. Потому что, ну, они не знают, они не могут мне дать стул. Но я могу взять стул, и я могу их попросить сесть. It creates relationship right, right there. Uh, мы посидели, um, and I will sit until people say, Peter, thank you. Okay, thank you. Get up. Uh, we're done. Chairs are out, and, and uh, the conversation is over. So... Смотрите, ребята, um, 9-11. 9-11, we have only... Let me, I'll just show these slides. Uh, I will not talk about them much. Lead people through growth process. Um, задача молодежных лидеров взять людей там, где они есть, и привести их там, где Бог их хочет видеть. Правильно? Правильно? Yes. Берешь там, где они есть, and move them through process. Момент там, где, они, где Бог их хочет видеть. Поэтому, когда вы собираетесь, мы говорим молодежные группы, молодежные общения, um, develop relationships and grow in spiritual maturity. Две вещи. Мы всегда или чаще, я помню себя, фокусировался на spiritual maturity. Мы должны петь, молиться, читать Библию, you know, that is important, that is important. Очень важно, правильно, develop relationships. Uh, being friends first, allow people to grow together. So how do you create an environment? Поэтому, how do you create an environment? Here it is. You share what is going on in your life and spiritual journey. Всегда хорошо. Я сегодня начал, рассказал о своей семье, правильно? I mean, it's just easier to understand who I am, where I'm coming from. Do that every time. Слушай, ребята, как у вас неделя прошла? Чё нового? You know, watch sports, you know, who play games, what kind of movies out, you know, just kind of talk about what youth is like living, you know, um, going through what's going on in your life, and then, hey, how's your spiritual journey? What did you guys read, you know, how, how was your like, spiritual journey? Things going well? No, not so well. Study. How Bible emphasizes the life application for the situation. You know, maybe people have fears, maybe somebody's getting sick, maybe somebody died in the church. You know, address the issue. Don't just like be ignorant about it. Be focused. Biblical emphasis on life application. Support. Prayer and growing accountability. Very important. Um, I think Tim Enlow, when Tim Enlow was here, um, we were talking with Tim about what works the best to make first time visitor to come back to your church. You know, there are many systems. You know, some people fill out connection cards. You give them a gift. You send them a text message. You, you connect through a follow-up process. Tim Allen said that they did research with Assemblies of God, and here's what they came up with. They said, if at the end of the service, uh, ministers, you know, like three, four, five people, will come to the first time visitor, introduce themselves, saying, hey, I'm a minister of this church, you know, so happy to have you here. Um, you know, we're, we're excited that you were at the service. Is there something that we can pray for you? That, that phrase shows that you love, care, and is, you're real. Person opens up, talks about the problem, you pray, and that support brings the people back. I'm like, that was like the simplest thing ever. 
I mean, how hard is it to pray? I would love to pray, but I want people to come to me. But if we flip the tables and I come over to a person, first time visitor, ask them and I pray for them, that builds the relationships. Build the relationship and spiritual maturity. Serve. Serve those inside and outside the church. Um, and I think I really like this idea. Inside is first. We can focus on like homeless uh, events. We can focus on uh, street outreach. We can focus on you know, poor women, you know, just anybody. Think about the needs inside the church. There, there is a great need. Uh, kids uh, growing in homes uh, where parents are busy. You know, can we do something? Maybe uh, doing homework together. Maybe uh, helping people uh, you know, with food. I mean, Slavic community is really good. They know. Uh, see food boxes, you know, generous they use, you know, they help each other out. That that is pretty good. So food usually is not an issue. Uh, but you know, maybe how about um, some families don't have uh, like some kids would like to come to the youth service, but parents working they don't have a car. How about just like go and picking up the kids and say, hey, I'll give you a ride to church and I'll take you home after. You know, sir. Sure. Develop relationship, spiritual maturity, and as you drive those kids with you, uh, there and back, you build a relationship. He'll be part of the small group. That's how the. And then they ask questions. So how was the youth service? What did you like? What did you like? What did you listen? And what did you hear? You know, uh, you know, and it just grows. So, um, got it. Uh, I will finish one more. Actually, yeah, I'll take two minutes. Um, really good book uh, for preachers. Um, Boys and girls uh, alike, um, it's a really, really good book. Uh, if you have relatives who is a truck driver, uh, give them this book, they'll really appreciate it. Uh, Andy Stanley, Communicating for Change. Communicating for a Change, Andy Stanley. Um, uh, so this book is talk about how to communicate, how to deliver a message as if you're delivering a load on the truck. Uh, how you load, how you tie it, how you keep it, how you deliver it, and how you unload. A really cool book. But Andy talks about five words that you can preach and share the story without notes. And it goes like this. You start with me. Uh, start with yourself and something personal. Last Sunday I was preaching about Easter. Uh, I wondered how many people don't believe that Jesus for real rose again. So the question is, we. Do we all believe that uh, that people can rise up? Do you guys believe that uh, that people can uh, rise? Yes. Have you witnessed anybody being raised up? No. Uh, one time, somebody like, oh, okay, all right. Uh, you know, I, I don't have a lot of accounts, but I read in the Bible. So what does God talk about being raised again. So show what God has to say on the subject. So we just made a connection, right? I had that question. You had that question. We are like, huh, interesting topic. God, how does this apply to our lives? Because Jesus was resurrected, that opened up the door for us to enter the heaven. I mean, that's very applicable. If we don't believe that Jesus died and rose again, there is no way we can go to heaven, right? So we're talking about eternity. How many choices for eternity do you have? It's eternity with Jesus or without Jesus? Which one do you want to choose? Ah, you're smart people, so okay. So if um, Jesus rose and we believe that Jesus rose and we believe that Bible is true and we want to accept Jesus, we're going to go to heaven. Are you guys excited about going to heaven with me? Yes, I love you too. Uh, can you imagine, can you imagine if every person, every person in this world chooses Jesus and we're going to spend eternity with everybody? Would it be awesome with all of our neighbors, schoolmates, workers? That'd be cool, huh? That's how you preach. That's your sermon. Uh, it, it doesn't have to be complicated. Me, we, God, you, we. Easy. Uh, you know, five notes, five pages, five points. Uh, it's just a natural flow of conversations. That's how kids share their story. Um, easy to remember, easy to understand. And I think this is it. And um, you can, uh, I'll leave this. If you want to have questions afterwards, you can ask. This is just a lead people through process. They come into this, they go through steps, 
and they multiply. Believe, belong, become. That's the model in our church. That's how we um, teach uh, multiplication. So anyway, any questions? Да, конечно. Любой слайд, любые вопросы, anything, anything. Может быть, у вас есть какой-то testimony, может быть, у вас есть principle that you guys want to share that something worked um, from what I said. It works in your life. You can, you can say, yep, yeah, it true works. Philip, give me three things to remember. Sorry. <laughs> Follow-up is so important, um, um, and I think it's got to be intentional. Intentionality matters. Um, we naturally are not kind people, not loving. That's natural. So to be a loving community, we have to be intentional about being a loving community. We want to notice every person. We want to come. We want to talk. We want to serve, and that is cool. And again, that's about the culture of your team. That's great. Good testimony. Okay, who didn't say a word? You can say it out loud, just one word. Um, anybody else on the last row? Ladies? No, you're all good. Gentlemen? Okay, all good. Всегда это самое страшное, что может быть у любого учителя, когда нету вопросов. И либо никто ничего не понял, либо ты разжевал, так что аж... Окей. Да, sure, sure. У тебя там есть слайд. То, что хотел бы пастор, чтобы мы знали, да? Угу. А что пастор бы не хотел, чтобы мы знали? Um, знаешь, есть вещи, которые uh, все пасторы не хотят, чтобы следующее поколение знало. Mm, есть. Um, и, uh, да, да. Um, uh, наверное, не, не, uh, мы, мы все не хотим, чтобы вы знали, что ministry is hard. Uh, ministry is difficult at times. Uh, it's challenging. Uh, there'll be moments that are like super hard. You'll be criticized and blamed for something that you didn't do, and then you'll be criticized and blamed for something you did do. So either you did or didn't, it's your fault anyway. Uh, so, and that's part of life, part of uh, you know ministry. Um, another thing that pastors don't preach on a lot is that Joseph was sold. He wasn't stolen by uh, bad you know, bandits. He was sold by brothers. Jesus was not crucified by Romans. He was betrayed by disciple. Um, part of ministry is that sometimes the hardest and biggest wounds you will get from people that surround you in ministry. It, it's going to hurt. Um, you know, I wish, I wish I could tell you the story that, you know, uh, when I'm done, you know, what? my early 60s, I will tell you, you know, I was surrounded by the best people ever and nobody ever hurt me. And that is not true. I think pain is part of the process and we grow, we grow, we mature up uh, as we, so enduring pain is a good thing. Um, I think um, pastors will never tell you what other people tell them, you know, uh, and sometimes you learn to love people who confessed certain things or uh, said hurtful things to you or about, about others, and you learn to dig a big hole and you bury it. Bury it deep and you forget. Uh, so uh, you have to have a gift, gift of forgetfulness. Uh, it's got to it's be, it's part of the ministry. Uh, you got to forget and forgive. Whatever comes first, I don't know. 
sometimes you forgive first and then you forget or forget and forgive. Uh, you still have to dig it and cover it and forget. So pray about it. That's part of ministry. So, um, But again, that is nothing better than serving God. So I want, I want to finish with this. I want to talk about uh, diaconi, deacons first, right? What was the primary role for deacons? Why were deacons chosen? Or chosen? Uh, I, can I challenge you? Read that chapter or read that story at home. What was the problem? What was the problem? Com people were complaining that food was not equally divided. Think about it. People were complaining about fairness. Fairness is such a messed up thing, you cannot be fair. Church is not a fair place. It's a place of forgiveness, grace. Uh, God is not fair God. He's God of mercy. By, by fairness, God should punish every sin with death. That same moment. That's fair. You know, eye for an eye. But God loves us so much that he shows grace. And people will complain, how come you punish this guy but not this guy? How come this lady can come in like, a, you know, ripped jeans and this one cannot? How come this guy can have long hair and I cannot? You know, blah, blah, blah. How come, you know, мы только по-русски проповедуем, молодежь ничего не понимает. По-английски проповедуем, старики ничего не понимают. It's not fair. It's not fair for me. It's not fair for them. It's not fair. Задача диаконов. Make sure that everybody is being fed. Don't have favorites. Love your older generation. Feed your older generation. Take care of your young people. Feed your younger people. Uh, those who are on outskirts, take care of the outskirts. Those who uh, seek righteousness, encourage them to seek righteousness. Just that's the deacon's job. Make sure that everybody gets fed. Got it? I wanted to say something else. Uh, that was, uh, but I think that's a pretty good place to end. Um, and that is the same th uh, applies to all leaders. Your guys' job, your guys' job to love people. I love people. Um, love conquers all. Um, don't think that position will give you more authority. That is not true. Authority is given to people who care. You show that you care, people will respect you. Uh, um, honor can be um, positional. Respect is always learned. Earned, not learned, earned. And you can earn respect more than a lot of people who have uh, positions. You can lead up in many ways by showing uh, that you are real. So be real, love people, serve them passionately, and God will lift you up at a certain time. Be real.